on the one, two, three. Back again on the one, two, with the mad beats in the garden. And I'm starting on manner of new shoots. Off the vine, we got slips to make the fresh roots. Couple pieces to teach like a gangster compete. Raising the ruckus, sweet potatoes in the bucket. They see me rolling, now I'm strolling. To the grocery rows, we goes like pow. Actual content starts now. Gotta get him out of the way. Get the little new potato gone. Where are you? That seriously was it? She's a sad potato. She's barely yielding potatoes at all. Gotta put in something more southern. Welcome back. Today we are pulling sad potatoes. I had some extra pieces of potato, so I put them in this grocery row garden to fill in some of the gaps. And it's not really the best adapted crop to my area. Plus, my soil, as you all know, is not particularly good. So all that is making excuses for my so-so harvest of potatoes. I still grow potatoes, but they're not a main crop for me and I want to get these out of here so I can plant something that'll do a little bit better in our climate Lord willing and the creek don't rise but this was a good little stop gap get a few roots out of the ground fill it in today we are resetting a grocery row garden for our main summer crops potatoes are a cool season so you know we put these in February I guess and we pull them out now and I've still got time to put in some good crops afterwards and so I figured I'd take you all along and show you how I'm going to reset this bed and make it into a beautiful gorgeous hopefully more productive bed for the rest of the season get it off on a better start Many people are concerned about using the old foliage from potatoes or tomatoes or other things to mulch back in the beds or to use as compost, they'll say, oh, my basil plant has mildew on it, or my potato's got some sort of a wilt or something. And so they're afraid to compost it back. But I always throw all my materials back if they're diseased or not, because I believe the ecosystem of the soil and of my gardens is complex and is able to deal with it. The power of a vibrant ecosystem with tons and tons of different life in it is that pathogens generally don't become a problem. And if your mineral levels are good and your fungi and bacteria levels are high, I, don't, I just wouldn't worry about it. I throw everything back in the compost pile and trust that the diversity of different insects and the worms and then the fungi and the bacteria and everything else is going to deal with the problems. I'd rather put the nutrients right back into the ground and let it fight. And if plants are too weak and they get sick, I don't really want that plant. And I will save seeds from the plants that are healthy and happy and let the ones that are sick die off. There's always something else I can grow that'll do better in the climate. I'm just gonna put some lime down this bed. Get a little calcium in here. Our soil is also very acid, 5.4 pH when we tested it. Now, our potato harvest out of this bed was pretty crummy. But I love potatoes. I know they're, they're not the best thing to grow here, but there's nothing like the flavor of homegrown potatoes. We had some other rows that we pulled out where we had put in biochar and alfalfa pellets and they did pretty good. 
So we've got maybe, I don't know, 100 pounds or so that we've pulled out that were better. This area, well, it's not that happy. And you never know from year to year. Last year, we had a great yield of potatoes out in this area. But then we had fresh alfalfa pellets and stuff. This time I just stuck them in the ground and I don't think I even amended or anything. And we had a weird late spring and all that stuff. So it's important to plant lots of different things. Like if you just rely on one crop, like man, potatoes did really great this year. So next year we're just gonna plant tons and tons of potatoes. I don't think that's wise. Put all your crops in one basket. Right now I have sweet potatoes going and potatoes and African and Asian yams. Five different species of true yams. I have cassava, I have pumpkins. It's got all kinds of potential calorie crops. And when you're afraid, you know, how are the supply lines gonna work out? Are things gonna do well? Are we gonna have food? Make redundancies. If this was my only potato bed and I didn't have all those other beds that were doing well, it would be a very hungry season. So it makes sense to uh, do your best to get a whole bunch of different things growing, which is why I designed the food forest systems and this grocery row system is because we've got, you know, 40 or 50 different food plants growing together rather than just one that we're gonna count on. Like, we're not gonna just count on corn and soybeans and do a rotation like that. There's no way. This is much better. We've got all kinds of different things. And if the climate gets hotter, we're good on these plants. And if the climate gets colder, we're good on these other plants. And if we have a long wet spring, well, this will do well. This one won't. Just redundancy, backups, backups, backups. This is another thing I like to add for micronutrients. Now that I got my calcium, my pH adjusted. I like to throw a little kelp meal around. If you live near the ocean, you could just throw some seaweed into your beds. I used to do that all the time. But now I'm relegated to base consumerism and I have to actually buy the bounty of the ocean. Now you don't have to do this. You could use green sand and azomite and Steve Solomon's mix and all kinds of other things. Whatever you can get minerals out of is great. And I know that I have very, very poor soil here and I want to make the minerals available to the soil life as much as possible so they have something to grab and feed to my plants. If that potato yield is an indicator, which it is, of something missing, I want to fill in the gaps and then let the plants take what they like. Free choice minerals, as they say when you give your goats or cows minerals. Always try to put a little bit of kelp meal in. It's a beautiful source of all of the minerals of the ocean. Another thing you can do is if you can get ocean fish, you can make barrels with some ocean fish water. You could throw a little bit of seawater into the barrels too to get a little bit of minerals that way. But the concentration inside of ocean fish is really good. You know, fish emulsion. And some people will ask me too, you know, can I use freshwater fish or can I just go and get the algae out of my pond instead of seaweed? Well, you can but it's not gonna have the same ocean minerals because the ocean is loaded with lots and lots of stuff that you are not gonna have in a regular freshwater lake. Think of all of the minerals floating around in seaweed. Everything from molybdenum to gold is dissolved in the ocean. You're just kind of bringing it back to the land. Our next amendment is rabbit manure. Rabbit manure is Great stuff, it's kind of a slow release manure. It doesn't burn like chicken manure will. So rabbit manure is a really great thing if you've got access to it. Because it's slow release and because the rabbits eat alfalfa, alfalfa is not sprayed with Grazon. 
The rabbits also eat various weeds and kudzu and all that stuff. But I know that this manure is not contaminated like a lot of horse or cow manure or purchased manures might be. It's not contaminated at least with the kind of herbicides that stick around and destroy all of your gardens. And you can pile this stuff up deep, make your plants very, very happy, but you don't have to. This is plenty. I'm just giving them maybe a half an inch or a little less spread around down the rows. It's also very biologically active, meaning there's a lot of life in it, a lot of uh, microorganisms. Having gone through the digestive tract of an animal and then sat for a while and bred good stuff, My final step, I've got this great wood chip mulch that the tree trimming companies dropped for us. And some elves placed multiple piles of it for me earlier this morning, all the way down this row, just getting ready. It's important to cover the ground here to keep the biological activity alive. This is why I like to throw my amendments first and then cover them. I like to keep, I want to keep all that rabbit manure from drying out and baking in the sun and ended up partially sterilized by the UV. I'd rather bury it underneath the ground where the soil life can work on it. This mulch has already been breaking down for six months and it's full of fungal life. So between the two, we should have some real good soil activity going on. I don't always mulch my annual beds, but if at all possible, I mulch my perennials with whatever I can get, whether it's wood chips or weeds or grass clippings, anything I can get. Keep the ground covered, helps the rain soak in better, keeps the roots cool, slowly feeds the plants as the mulch breaks down. I like mulches that break down, like these wood chips, or like clean straw or hay or whatever, because it's like a slow release fertilizer and humus supplement to the soil, unlike something like, you know, that tire rubber or gravel or something like that that doesn't really feed the ground and just becomes a mess. I don't like plastic mulch. I like to mulch a little bit more like nature mulches with a huge wood chipper. This is how easy it is to plant sweet potatoes. I got a few starts from a friend. I rooted a few potatoes and got them growing here and there. And just cut off the vines, clean them up. Just stick pieces of vine in the ground. They wilt for a few days. You'll think they're dead. And then they start growing and they run all over the place one of the best adapted routes to this area. Georgia is a capital of sweet potato growing. And Alabama is same climate, perfect. And they also love to run over mulch. I'll put them about 16 inches apart down either side here. This is a pomegranate tree. The grocery row gardens are a mix, right? So you have your perennials in them. I have much denser perennial collections in some of the gardens, but this last one I just have some pomegranates and a plum and a few other things and some permanent strawberries down on the end. But 
anything in between the orchard layout, you plant your short crops like sweet potatoes or potatoes or cabbages or whatever else. And this will be our summer crop and we'll harvest these in the fall. I get asked moderately often about sweet potatoes. You know, when do you know how to, you know, when do you know it's time to dig them? Well, if you really want some sweet potatoes, you've had them in for a few months, you can do some test digs and see if they're ready. Or you can just simply wait until right before your first frost and dig them and get that absolute biggest roots you can. That's what I usually do. Right before we get our frost and it would have taken the tops of them off, I just go out and dig them. I don't want them at grocery store size, you know, like this big. I want them as big as possible, and we've gotten them as big as this on a couple of occasions. But these guys are gonna fill in here, and they will be my understory, and we'll plant the overstory, other than the trees, plant the overstory for this season in just a minute. Before we go any further, I'd like to talk about our sponsors, the Compost Your Enemies t-shirt. I'm so excited about this shirt. Let me run a brief advertisement for it. Hey, hon, come check out this soil. It's taken me all day to do. Hi, hon. Wow, this soil is so rich. I know, it's trying to be like me. Oh my word. Is this a water apple tree? Yeah, it's gonna go great in the soil. Wow, it's really gonna take off here. What's in the soil anyways? It's best you keep your business to yourself. All right, I don't need no answers. Right here, I have okra seeds that we saved. Plus, I mixed in some different varieties of okra. This is a really simple way to save seeds, incidentally. Save your old jars with a little rubber gasket inside, jelly jars, peanut butter jars, whatever, and get some of these silica gel packets. These take the moisture out and put your seeds in it. If you save seeds or if you have seeds in packets, you could stuff the packets in a little silica gel in with it and the seeds keep just put the jar in your refrigerator they'll keep for years that way so let's plant these guys this will be our shrub layer slash overstory to the ground layer ground cover layer we just planted okra plants get very tall at least the ones we grew so we're gonna give them lots of space just put a few seeds in each hole, just in case the moles get them or something. And I'll leave this little area open. I don't want the mulch to come back over this. Just make little pockets here and there. The sweet potatoes will happily run underneath and around these without being a problem. So we get two crops from the same space. If you plant stuff really closely, you may have to water more. I don't like to have to water. So I put these, plenty of space here. This one might fight with this cassava plant, but I don't care. Finally, just because it's crazy, I have some kosher hamburger dill chip seeds, which are gonna plant. Look at this mix. These are actually Ezekiel's Land Race watermelons mixed with all the different varieties that he added in this year. So we're gonna stick some of these through, just let them fight with the sweet potatoes. They'll grow above the ground, the sweet potatoes will blow, grow below and we'll see how it works out.
the last little thing I'm doing here, I'm planting some of these watermelons right along this wide path. We made this path wide enough to drive a tractor through, but now we don't actually have a tractor to use anymore because somebody else got lent it. So I figure, you know, got all this nice open mulch space. Let's plant a few watermelons along the edge and just let them run over this way. Because I, I've never heard of there being too many watermelons. I don't think anybody's like, oh no, oh no, we have too many watermelons. No, that would be a great problem to have. Too many watermelons. So hopefully that happens. Maybe they'll just run across the side here. Just go over this whole thing. I can picture it. If the bugs allow it to happen, I'll be very, very happy. Thank you for joining me today. The grocery row gardening system is just a simple template for backyard gardening that I've developed over the last couple of years based on influences from all over the place, including Stefan Subkowiak of the Permaculture Orchard. If you're not subscribed to his channel, I highly recommend it. Uh, he has it on a commercial scale, and I said, you know, we could do something similar uh, and make it a backyard kind of a garden system. And it's also based on the work of uh, Andrew Millison, who does these beautiful edible hedges. And it's got some influence from Ernst Goetsch down with the Syntropic Farming and just all these different ideas that percolated along with some experiments that I had done over the last decade with putting perennial beds into my annual systems. And now it's really coalesced into something that I really like, which I've used in the tropics. And I'm using it here in zone 8B, Lower Alabama. And we have people planting this system now all the way up into Canada, down in South America and in Australia and elsewhere. So I'm very excited about seeing how people's experiments do. It's just a little booklet kind of outlaying, you know, laying out how I set this system up. And I'll put a link to that below if you are interested. It's $9.99 and you can join the experiment and please send me pictures of what you're doing because when we do a really big fat second edition, that's totally awesome. It will have everybody's stories in it from around the world. So catch you all next time. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell and all that stuff. And until next time, may your thumbs always be green.